suffering and misery. Our hearts are longing for the endless home of peace and love and harmony. No more bitterness, hatred or greed. Paradise is the place we need. I feel the peace inside of me. Greetings and peace. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown with another episode of Interfaith Issues where we discuss the issues of common interest to the three Abrahamic religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Today, I'm going to be talking on the concept of original sin. The reason that this concept is of interest is because it is not unanimously accepted by the three monotheistic religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. As a matter of fact, even though the concept of original sin is prevalent in Western Christianity, it is not even universally accepted among Christians. Now, when we look at the Abrahamic faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, we find that Judaism and Islam have no concept whatsoever of original sin. In fact, the Eastern Christian churches also do not follow this tenet of Trinitarian Christianity. Um, the concept of original sin, I think everybody knows. The, the proposal is that Adam and Eve sinned when they disobeyed God's commandment not to eat of the fruit of the forbidden tree in paradise. When they ate of the forbidden tree, they became sinful, and that, that sin has persisted within their lineage, which means you and me, all of mankind, until this time. And it is, in effect, one of the critical elements of Christian faith, because Christian faith teaches us that we are born sinful, we have sin as an integral element of our being, and we can only achieve redemption through uh, through belief in Jesus Christ because according to their tenets of faith it was the atoning sacrifice of his death that paid for the, the sin, the original sin that afflicts all of us. Well, to begin with, I just want to first start with a common sense sort of observation. That observation is that if we look at a baby and just look at its face, look at its innocence. It's very hard for us to convince ourselves that this baby, if it dies, this baby's going to hell. And it's going to burn in, in hellfire forever because of original sin. Now, the fact of the matter is, I don't know anybody who has ever looked at a baby and said, oh, how evil. Oh, this one needs to be in jail. The fact of the matter is, babies look so innocent. They look so pure. And there's a reason for that. The reason for that is that, according to Judaism, according to Eastern Christianity, according to Islam, there is no concept, or there is no validity to the concept of original sin. Now, let's back up a minute and just look at the whole concept of sin and compare between the two religions, Christianity and Islam. I would start by pointing out that Islam views the concept of sin very differently to begin with. In Islam, there is no such concept as sinning in the mind. If you conceive an evil deed in Christianity, Christianity tells us that's a sin. You thought a bad thing, that's a sin. In Islam, Islam looks at it very differently. In Islam, if you conceive of a bad thought, but you do not act upon it, it is not a sin. As a matter of fact, if you have a bad thought, 
but you do not act upon it, it actually becomes what? A good deed. Why does it become a good deed? Look, I'm going to ask all of us, all of us to step back for a moment and look at this from the point of view not of what we have been taught, not from the religion we have been raised upon, not from the teachings of our church, not from the spiritual guide that we follow, but simply from the level of common sense. Simply from the level of common sense, we have to, I feel, I feel we have to agree that mankind, both men and women, are more inclined to bad thoughts than they are to good thoughts. That is our nature. That is our existence. Think about it. If a man is walking down the street and he sees a beautiful woman, half naked, walking towards him, is his first thought to run to the closest house of worship and pay charity? Is his first thought to go and take care of some orphans? Is his first thought to go out and commit some act of beauty and righteousness? All you men out there, come on now, you know what I'm saying. For all of you women, if you're walking on the street, you look down and you see a three-carat diamond ring sitting on the sidewalk, just staring at you saying, please pick me up. How many women in the world have as their first thought that they are going to grab that ring, hold it high, and shout to everybody on the street, here is a perfect quality, three-carat diamond ring. Who lost it? Who does it belong to? As opposed to our nature, which is, as much as we hate to admit it, our first thought is we want to take that and put it in our pocket. Now, the fact of the matter is our human existence is that we are more inclined. We are more inclined to sinful thoughts than we are to good thoughts. It is the matter of mastering our sinful nature that is worthy of reward. So doesn't it make sense that we're going to have sinful thoughts? It's the way we are made. It is our constitution. The question then is, what do we do with those sinful thoughts? Do we act upon them? In which case, it goes from being a bad thought to actually an evil deed? Or do we act against the sinful thought? In which case, it becomes a good deed. In which case, we are rewarded for overcoming our base desires and doing the right thing, not the wrong thing. Now, in Christianity, we are taught you have a bad thought, that's a sin. That's bad, that will count against you. Even if you don't do anything, you had the bad thought, that, that's going to count against you. In Islam, you have a bad thought, you don't do anything about it, you know what? It doesn't count against you. Why? Because you conquered it. You overcame it. Instead of submitting to the evil that arose within your consciousness, Instead, you overcame it, and that is deserving of reward. If you have a good thought, that's good also, and that is deserving of reward. But if you actually acted out as a good deed in the mercy of our Creator, Allah rewards the good deed anywhere from 10 to 700 times the actual value of that good deed. Why? Because it's not so easy for us to do good deeds. You have $100 in your hand, and you have the choice between using it for the bad things that would bring you worldly pleasure, or you have the choice of giving it to somebody who is more in need of it than you are. That is a very difficult thing to do. So in the mercy of our Creator, the good deed is rewarded by a factor of multiples. The bad deed is rewarded according to the value of the bad deed, but there is no such thing as sinning in the mind. Now, this is a very big difference between the concept of sin as it is conceived, which is in the mind, before it is even acted out. So, another point I think that we have to remember is that those individuals those communities and those societies which allowed themselves to be overrun by sin eventually decayed. 
And we see this time and time and time again. If you look at history, we can think of the Persians, we can think of the Romans, we can think of the, uh, the Greeks, we can think of Sodom and Gomorrah, we can think of many, many cultures and societies and civilizations that were devoted to hedonism, they were devoted to chasing the pleasures of this life, the sinful pleasures of this life, and eventually the entire society fell into decay and was destroyed. Now, that's enough information for all of us to chew on for a few minutes. So let's take a break and we'll come back shortly. Welcome back to the concept of original sin. This concept does not exist in Islam. It only exists in Western Christianity, not in Eastern Christianity. And even then, a lot of people have difficulty with the subject for the reason that I mentioned. They look at a baby and they just cannot convince themselves that this baby is carrying the taint of any kind of sin. It looks too pure. So they have to ask themselves, where does this concept come from? If you are a Christian and you're told this teaching comes from Jesus Christ, be careful. That is not anything that Jesus Christ ever taught. Remember, again, Jesus Christ was an Orthodox Jew. This is why he is known as Rabbi Jesus. He taught Orthodox Jewish law. When Jesus was recorded as having said in Matthew 19:14, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them. Let the little children, the little children come to me and do not forbid them. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. What do you take from that message? If these children are carrying the taint of original sin, how can, quote, for of such be the kingdom of heaven? When the church is telling us that of such is the domain of hellfire if they die unbaptized. Jesus Christ was teaching a very clear message that children have a purity that is conveyed in his words, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Do we find any other teachings that might reinforce that? The Old Testament, the book of laws, the book of revelation that existed in the time of Jesus, the book that he followed as an Orthodox Jew, records in Ezekiel 18.20, records, quote, the son shall not bear the guilt of the father. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father. Nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. The wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Where does that say the wickedness will be passed on down through the ages, through the generations, through the lineage? I missed it. As many times as I have read the Bible, I must have missed it. Because here I find Jesus Christ teaching of the purity of children. Here I find the Old Testament that Jesus Christ professed as the law of his time, teaching that the wickedness of the wicked will be upon themselves. Wait a minute. Did you miss it? Did I miss it? Where did this concept of original sin come from? And where is it going with this line of thought? Because what I am effectively suggesting is that there is no basis for the concept of original sin in the teachings of the one upon whom the Christian faith is based, in the teachings of the prophet, Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus Christ, in his words, directly contradicts the concept of original sin. Now, if there's any doubt, the passage I read about the wickedness of the wicked being upon themselves is repeated in Deuteronomy 24, 16. It is an unequivocal point. It is not a slip of the pen. Now, those Christians who want to argue the point, those Christians who want to make it go away, who want to dismiss what I am saying, what do they say? They say, well, that's Old Testament. Ezekiel, Deuteronomy, that's Old Testament. 
We're Christians, we follow New Testament. What's the problem with that argument? The problem with that argument is that, yeah, it's Old Testament, but you know what? It's not older than Adam, okay? If original sin had afflicted mankind since the time of Adam, no prophet of any age would ever have taught that the wickedness of the wicked is upon themselves. Any prophet of any age would have taught the concept of original sin. But you know what? Nobody did. So if we are going to look for how we resolve this problem, we have to look not at the religion that is thrown into controversy, that is thrown into self-contradiction over the issue. No. We have to look at the continuity in the chain of revelation. We have to look at the fact that the Old Testament predicted three prophets to come. We know that. The Jewish scholars know that. And we know it from the New Testament because when the Jews sent their Levites and their priests to interrogate the John the Baptist on who he was, what did they ask him? They asked him, who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, no. Are you the Christ? He said, no. Are you that prophet? He said, no. It was not good enough to say at one time. They repeated and they asked, if you are not Elijah, if you are not the Christ, if you are not that prophet, who are you? They were clearly speaking of three prophets to follow. Now, despite John the Baptist's denial, I think it's very reasonable to conclude that the first two of the three predicted prophets were John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. But you know, you've got three, you take away two, what does that leave you? That leaves you one to come. So if we're going to look for resolution, to this concept of original sin, we have to ask ourselves, is there a religion out there that is consistent with the teachings of Jesus Christ on this matter? A religion which might represent the teachings of the third final predicted prophet. I would suggest that yes, Islam has no concept of original sin. In the religion of Islam, each person is accountable for their own actions. A person bears their own sins from birth? No, 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 no. Because again, that would not make sense. That would not be godly. A person bears the weight of their sins from the time of discrimination, from the age of discrimination, from the age at which they know the difference between right and wrong. That's what makes sense. That is what makes sense. And that is what a person is held accountable for in the religion of Islam. According to the Holy Quran, quote, man can have nothing but what he strives for. That is Surah 53, Ayat 38. Quote, who receives guidance, receives it for his own benefit. Who goes astray, does so to his own loss. No bearer of burdens can bear the burden of another. No bearer of burdens can bear the burden of another. So at 17, I at 15. Each person bears responsibility for his or her own actions, and nobody goes to hell because they bear original sin as a birthright. Or perhaps we should say as a birth wrong. Now, I would like to conclude this talk by going back to the important point that I made, the point that a lot of people in the audience have heard and said to themselves, said, wait a minute, wait a minute, where did he get that? And that is the point of the three predicted prophets to follow. This is from John 1, 19 through 21. In this passage, the Bible tells us that the Jews sent their priests and Levites to basically challenge John the Baptist and question who he was. And they asked him in this way, quote, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed. 
I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. He went on to address their concerns when they asked him for clarification. They said, quote, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, not Elijah, nor the prophet? Again, these are the three predicted prophets that the Old Testament speaks of. Christ, Elijah, and the prophet. Now, we fall into a little bit of difficulty. You know, there's no uncertainty who the Christ is. Who is Elijah? According to the Bible, one passage does identify John the Baptist as Elijah. Another passage does not. It is an inconsistency, but I think we have to take it upon faith that John the Baptist was the first of the three. Jesus Christ was the second of the three. Who was the third of the three? Well, we would expect to find a hint in the New Testament. If there were a prophet to follow Jesus Christ, it would just make godly sense to us that there would at least be a hint in the New Testament of a final prophet to follow. And in fact, there is. In John 14, 16, Jesus Christ just talks of Alos Paracletos, another paraclete to follow after the end of his mission. Let's put these two things together. In John 14, 16, Jesus Christ speaks of Alos Paracletos, another paraclete. The key word here is not paraclete. Let's not worry about what paraclete means. Some people say advocate, some say comforter, some say Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter. What matters is that Jesus Christ speaks of Allos Paracletos, another paraclete, to come after his mission. At the same time, the first epistle of John 2.1 identifies Jesus Christ as a paraclete. What does this mean? Jesus Christ is a paraclete. He is saying after his mission, another paraclete will come. Another what? Another of whatever he is. Does it not make sense that he can be understood to have been speaking of the final prophet predicted in the Old Testament, the third of the three, the final prophet to complete revelation. Here is where we find a hint in the teachings from Jesus Christ himself of the completion of the revelation in the person of a final prophet. Once again, I remind all of you watching, if you want further information, if you would like to read on depth, please visit my website, www.leveltruth.com, you will find everything that I have said and a great deal more in my books, starting with this one, Misguided. For now, this is Dr. Lawrence Brown concluding this episode of Interfaith Issues. Thanking you for being my audience, thanking you for tuning in, and looking forward to seeing you next time. Greetings and peace. I feel the peace. Inside of me, a complete tranquility. I remember Allah, He remembers me. Feel the peace, feel the breeze. Fresh, pure, holy peace. Peace in you, peace in me, peace for everybody, fresh, pure, holy.